We're delighted to be visiting today with Dr. Ewell Porter, who for a number of years was professor of choral and church music at Baylor University. I believe he began his work there in 1955 and retired uh, probably 1980. And uh, many students that I've known through the years have given credit for their abilities in church music to the training that they received under Dr. Ewell Porter. Dr. Porter, we want you today to share with us, first of all, some of the background in your own life. Let us get a little better acquainted with you, and then we'll talk about your contribution in the history of music in our state as related through your own life. I was born in Franklin, Texas, and uh, went through grade school. Okay, I moved to Calvert, lived with my sister, went to Calvert High School and graduated from there in 1929. During my high school days, of course, uh, I was trying to be an athlete at the same time, I uh, kept busy in music, did all the leads in the musicals that they had, whether there were people that came through for one week for rehearse nighting day or whether it was a, a long musical that was put on by the school. So I graduated and Superintendent of the school was a real good friend of mine, and at Christmas time, he asked me if he got me a scholarship at Hardin Simmons because he already had me briefed real well on, on uh, the the dog mascot Dammit that's buried out in the campus at Hardin Simmons. Also, I could just see purple and gold all the time because he had me ready to go. In 1929, I went to Hardin Simmons University and received a full scholarship as a presidential scholarship, I suppose but I still wanted to play football against the advice of my oldest brother who said, you don't go out there to play football. And, but I did. And uh, in the fall, I got a knee hurt. And the first thing I could remember, was my brother told me, don't go out there and play football. And uh, in the spring, I started in singing on uh, what was known in as Baptist Student Union trips. I did all the singing for them. Mr. Work, who became a good friend of mine, was head of the music department. I was, happened to be a first tenor, a rare animal, you know, and he was after me all the time to, to, to be over in his department. I still hadn't decided to go for music, you know. Anyway, uh, got an invitation for the varsity that fall and went back, and about the th third or fourth week, I got a good injury and the coach told me, said, you uh, might be able to let her in football or play some your senior year, but that's a long, long time. So I turned in my uniform, went straight to the music school, and from then on, it was all music for me. So I sang on the Hardin Simmons Quartet for three and a half years, and we went everywhere. It just happened that the bass that was on that quartet for two years is in my senior adult choir now in Waco. He lives in my head. So we're back together. And after 55 years, we had a reunion of that quartet. We broke up in 1933 and the First Baptist Church of Amarillo and didn't meet any, uh, anymore until about three years ago, after 55 years. And the reason for us being apart so long is because the second tenor lived in, out in California and ended up in the, up in the in Oregon area. But we finally got him back. And at homecoming one year for Hardin Simmons, we sang. And it took us about 30 minutes to get back like we were, we thought, in 1933. I'm sure we weren't like it was in 33, but that's the way it was. But as far as teaching is concerned, I finished Hardin Simmons in the fall of 1932 and spent the time, the rest of the time there because I was on the quartet and we toured to the World's Fair all over the area. And during the, during the year, we'd sing sometimes three concerts on one Sunday and ended up in 1933 with money in the bank. And that was unbelievable you know, at that time because most people remember what it was like in 32 <clears> and 33. <throat> Paid our way through school that way. Then I finished and I was the only one that left the quartet three of them stayed and they got another first tenor. I started teaching in Hearn Public Schools and had to choir at the First Baptist Church. And one of the unusual happenings, I suppose, would be with my daddy. Because way back in the background, 
of, of my growing up. We had an organ in one corner of the living room, and my sister, who's in a nursing home in Waco now, played the organ. My brother uh, played the piano. An unusual piano had five attachments, five pedals. There are three regular pedals and a banjo and a guitar attachment. I've never seen one. I had never seen one before, not since then, but we used them almost every night. And my job was, because I was small, had small hands, was to clean the lamp chimneys, keep them real bright. A lot of singing of gospel songs with my daddy leading all the time. Then that, that brings me up to the fact that the first musical that I directed at the First Baptist Church, a cantata in Hearn. And at that time, he was on up in years. And we spent a long time in the afternoon combing his hair and shining his shoes and getting him all ready for this. Took him to this cantata. He sat through it, and after it was all over, and I thought it was just great. You know, we did a great job. My first one, I think I was 22. And... Uh, what to get him, took him to the car. We had driven about two blocks, and he said, now what was that you took me to? I said, Papa, that was a cantata. And we drove about two more blocks. I said, why did you ask me that? And he paused, he said, just so I never would go to another one, you know. So that my, I was deflated a little bit thin, but he said, why did you repeat over and over and over the same words I heard you the first time? But he did come. After I had the uh, college choirs, high school choirs in Brown, he did come to concerts and, and came right along with me. But that was quite an unusual experience for me in the beginning. That, uh, that was quite different from the gospel songs that we'd sung around the organ. So I finished four years of teaching in Hearn, and I married Christine Dennis from West of West Texas girl. And the, the climate around Muleshoe, Texas, and being a ranch girl was quite different from the climate in Central Texas. So she finally got, a common, got accustomed to that and was with me a long time. Anyway, we moved to Bryan, and I started the first a cappella choir, I suppose, a real high school a cappella choir in Texas. There were a lot of mixed courses, and they'd sing one or two numbers a cappella, but this was strictly a cappella, and I'd had these some of these students for three years, and I picked 30 of those out of about 120 for the first real, first a cappella choir in a high school of Texas. We hardly ever touched an instrument, had kids with perfect pitch and so forth, and uh, we had a great time. And I moved from there, from Bryan High School, over to teach and uh, be the head of the voice department and choral department at Sam Houston State. And I taught there three years and had fine choirs, mainly had to conscript the men because I went there in 45 and, a very, and had a very few men. And, uh, and all this time I was doing church music. Everywhere I've been, I had a, had a job either in a public school or in high school or in the college and a church choir. I've always had a church choir and thoroughly enjoyed it. Then uh, from Sam Houston, I moved to Hardin Simmons in uh, 1947, I believe it was, from 47 to 55. And when I go back in memory now, because we, for one of those choirs, which was 1951, 50, 50 or 51, somewhere along there, I go back to it as say, maybe the best choir I ever had, because we went out and got those just like you go out and get football players. One of the best first tenors is still a minister of music, I believe, up in uh, Tennessee, Jack K. And a bass, Truett, uh, I want to say <clears throat> Truett Rogers. And he was unhappy down at Baylor, so he came and sang in the choir. And Sam Prestige, his wife, was one of the best altos I had. And I look back to that choir as far as uh, comparing choirs are concerned, it's hard to do because from year to year, so I quit comparing, but I looked back, and the, the Baylor choir that I took to Carnegie Hall, and when we got on the bus after the Carnegie Hall performance, they said, now you've got to tell us that we were better than the Hardin-Simmons choir. I said, well, you were as good tonight as, as the Hardin-Simmons choir. I moved to Abilene and had the Hardin-Simmons choirs and also the choir at the First Baptist Church, and I've had fine, fine choirs and churches, but I would say 
that right up with the best would be the choir in the First Baptist Church in Abilene when I was there. So the uh, I didn't know it at the time, but Dr. White was at one time president of Hardin Simmons, and now he was president of Baylor, and he'd come out and visit with Judge Caldwell and different friends and, and tell them that he was just loaning me to them for a while. I never knew that until it really happened, and uh, that that he, there would be a time when he'd move me to Baylor. So uh, I enjoyed Huntsville, First Baptist Church, also Sam Houston. I enjoyed, I suppose, more First Baptist Church in Abilene with a wonderful, wonderful choir. Got up to 125 on Sunday mornings. And uh, the choirs at Hardin Seminary just were great. But uh, time came, you know, when Dr. White followed through with, with what he said he was going to do, but never to me would he ever say that until we, I was at Glorietta to lead the music for Youth Week, and I felt him <coughs> walk up behind me out on, the, on the, the porch that surrounds the dining hall. I was standing there by myself and overlooking the lake, and he walked up behind me and says, Charles Welburn and I are ready for you to come to Baylor. This was the last week in August. I said, when? He says, now. I said, there's no way, because I'd promised so many scholarships and helped people. One that has proven to be all I thought he would be, and that's Dr. Hugh Sanders, who now has the choirs at, at Baylor. And I, I would suppose, if, if not the top core director, among the, the best there is. And he was with me at Hardin Simmons. And that I'd promised help for him. And I said, no way could I, would I leave Hardin Simmons this late? you know, and come to Baylor. He said, well, I'll talk to you Christmas. And went all the way through that. And one morning after we'd uh, had the Christmas concert with the choirs at uh, Hardin Simmons, and also had presented the Messiah with a community orchestra and community choir <clears throat> and Abilene presented, presented the Messiah, the telephone rang and this lady said, Dr. White and Dr. Newman wants to meet you at 11 o'clock today at my house. And I said, whatever for? I knew what for, but I said, why are we meeting? Because <laughs> this thing was kind of supposed to be a secret, you know. I said, whatever for, because I couldn't imagine why we were meeting at this lady's house, but I found out later there was a purpose behind it all. And everything transpired as far as my going to Baylor in her living room, and I just knew everybody in Abilene would know it, but she never breathed it as far as I know. And his way, this was just before Christmas, and right after old oh, mid-semester woman there, uh, it was known that I was leaving Hardin Simmons and coming to Baylor. When I came to Baylor, I came as director of the uh, BRH Choir, which was, I suppose, uh, through the religion department, and especially Dr. Wimpy had charge of it. And Dr. Wimpy and Dr. White were the ones who really uh, was, was instrumental in bringing me to Baylor, and Charles Wilbur. And I remember a 400 audition from a chapel choir. And uh, we'd, we would be on the stage during chapel time, forum now. And uh, as soon as forum was over, we'd rehearse. That's the only time we had. And then the second semester or second term, then I got it scheduled where they'd have a regular time every day because the interest was, was such they needed to do that. And the interest was such the dean of, of School of Music, during my rehearsal, uh, at the end of chapel, he'd be standing in the back of Waco Hall listening. And he was determined then it was going to be included in, in the music school. And that's, I suppose, the second we were on the quarter system then, the second quarter is when it really got into the chapel choir was was taken into the music school. So also I was, I was known as Minister of Music over at Seventh and James. First rehearsal at Seventh and James, we had 120 people because I'd gone through uh, the auditions over at Baylor for the chapel choir. And they'd just gone into this new auditorium and uh, had bought new robes and so forth. And we worked through that with a fantastic music program as far as a senior adult was concerned, but nothing had been done, I mean, with, a, with the sanctuary choir, I'll call it, chancel choir. But nothing had been done for the youth or college group 
So we started the college choir at five o'clock on Sunday, and there'd be about a hundred there on it for the night service. See. Anyway, we went through that for a long, long time, and uh, it was a wonderful experience because I can remember how things were at church on Sunday night. You really were at church, and the music was such. Congregational singing was just tremendous. You know about at least half of them were students, you know, and in there. And I did a lot more with them as far as uh, the music, really uh, contemporary music on through Elijah, Messiah, and whatever oratorio we wanted to do. In connection with the, the choral department and vocal department, I'll say, uh, needed help. And Dean Sternberg took, oh, maybe in the spring or maybe in the winter. I hadn't been there long. He took me out to lunch, and he'd, he'd come and stood in the back of Waco Hall listening to my rehearsals. I, I really, sometime I might be aware of him being there, and sometime I wouldn't because uh, I didn't know it. And he, he said, man, you have fantastic tenor section. Where would you get those tenors? Well, they just auditioned, you know. And some of them were business majors and so forth and so on. Had some that were music majors. But at that time, the acapella choir had dropped down. They had two tenors. Baylor acapella choir had two tenors. And uh, like I said, uh, the, core, the whole vocal program and choral program needed help. And Dean Sternberg re recognized that. And, and it wasn't long then until I uh, was, uh, had the acapella choir. And, and went from there. Okay, I'd like to talk about the encampments and how we got started. And I was a good friend of, of Dr. J.D. Riddle, who was the first secretary, as, as we've learned, you know, for the church music department. And uh, I'm sure it was his idea to have these encampments. And then he brought me out from Abilene out to Luders, Texas, to do first with youth choir. And Dr. Sullivan, a pastor of First Baptist Church, Abilene at that time, came out as a pastor. And this is what I remember is the first encampment, our first uh, music camp that we had. And Mr. Riddle was uh, in charge of it then. And we started out, and that grew from uh, just youth choirs to have adult choirs also in that. And then Mr. Riddle uh, wasn't well, and he, they secured Mr. Forter Hayes as his assistant. And then after Mr. Riddle was sick and, and got sick during one of the, the music camps, and that had grown then to be very, very good. And the, the climate wasn't conducive at all because it was very warm and no air conditioning at all. And, uh, but we had good t times and we had many, many good ones. And the best ones, I'd, I would say, was at Highland Lake, Paisano, and, and Waco, and all, all the time. And the, 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 the largest one I remember, music camp, I can't tell you what year, but Waco Hall seated 2,700, and it was full of, of uh, young people, youth choirs. They came as far as Lubbock, all out in there. And uh, rehearsal time and handling 2,700 youth, you know, it took a, a great deal of discipline. Mr. Forte Hayes teased me all the time about being so firm. Uh, he called me mean, but I was just firm with him, that's all, and, and uh, they respected that. And we accomplished some things from it. We were talking about music camps, and we had many music camps, and used good music. They always... Uh, from the church music department of Mr. Forter Hayes and Mr. Prestige, always had good music to teach them, you know, from the lighter or, or more difficult. And uh, this was a springboard to what's going on now, the All-State. We got to where they picked the All-State choir, the best one from the youth choirs. And that's, that's a great work right now. From that, and I don't know exactly when, but I know when I got interested in senior adults. Well, see, I gave up three things that I'd been working real hard with, uh, the choral music at Baylor, the church music at 7th and James, 
and the music at the music camp and also the general encampment at Paisano all at one year. The thing that I remember most was the final night at Paisano and uh, you haven't heard congregational singing until you heard the Paisano group sing Victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was going to have to leave. I need to drive from, from uh, Paisano out close to Al Alpine to Dallas because I was going to Port Arthur the next morning. And so I had him stand and sing Victory in Jesus, then a prayer, and while the prayer was on, I slipped out and went to my car, car that was parked way off so they wouldn't hear me start it. I started the car and drove off the grounds at Paisano and looked back and said, goodbye, Paisano Mountain, and I haven't seen it since. First, I didn't see how in the world I'd get to Port Arthur as interim in the First Baptist Church, but a, a former choir member, his organist there, and they had a three-way hookup when they called me and had it all worked out. I'd drive to Dallas, catch Southwest at a certain time, about 12.30, I think, and I'd be in Port Arthur or Beaumont Port Arthur Airport about 2 o'clock. And the next, and they met me there and uh, I went to, uh, and got ready for Sunday. I went through Sunday and found out the schedule for choirs, uh, uh, the senior, uh, I mean the adult choir or, or church choir and the youth choir. So the, they had church at six o'clock. And so I made the announcements about the next Sunday, the uh, schedule, rehearsal for the uh, church choir and also the youth choir. And here came this fine looking gentleman and, and uh, another one from the senior adult. And uh, his name is Charlie Stokes. And he came up and said, you didn't say a word about us. And I said, well, who is us? He said, senior adults. And I said, well, I don't know about senior adults. They had about 60 and they'd been going real well. Uh, he said, when do you get here? I said, about two o'clock on Saturday afternoon. He said, could you meet us at four o'clock next Saturday? I said, yes. So they met me at the airport, went to my motel room, cleaned up, and they took me back down there. And there sat about 60 senior adults in a semicircle already. And uh, Mr. Stokes introduced me to them. And he said, we like to do uh, three things. We like to sing. We like to play 42, and we like to eat. And I said, okay. I, so we went ahead and I listened to him sing a little bit. I said, since you, this was my first experience with senior adults. I had no idea when I finished with Baylor choirs and Seventh and James choirs that, that I'd be working with senior adults. And they needed a lot of work. So I said, well, you, you put down, you stipulated three things that you like. I want to tell you three things that I like. I said, now, if we're going to have a senior adult choir, I don't want you to sing old slow dead songs. Second place, I don't want you to, to uh, scoot from note to note. Third thing, I don't want you to sound old. I said, now, I'll go with you on your three if you'll go with me on my three. So we started out, and there's another one. They made the announcement, senior adult choir would, would, uh, would meet and get organized, and everybody who'd like to be in a choir who hadn't had time before to be in the choir and uh, uh, would like to join a choir now. Well, the first morning we had 60-some-odd come to that meeting, and some of them came for the singing, you know. And uh, I saw right quick I had some talent there. And so we got started. They gave me 30 pieces of music for 60 people. So we'd pass it back and forth and rehearse. The next week we had 80. And the next week we had 110. It grew up to 110. But uh, it gotten to the point where I saw what I was going to do with them, and these people who came for the singing had decided, well, they'd better go over to the Saul Ross senior adult group. And so it's down now, and it, we're going real strong, and I suppose this senior adult choir now celebrating its 10th year is the best choir I've had because all the recruits are best senior adult choir I've had. 
all the recruits uh, that we got each semester are good singers and 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 very they want to learn as far as i'm concerned you know music creates worship and that should be the sole purpose for music in the church to create a worshipful atmosphere and then to the thought that I like to leave with people is this little couplet. For the common things of every day, God gave man speech in the common way. For the higher things men think and feel, God gave the poet words to reveal. But for height and for depth no pen can reach, God gave man music, the soul's own speech. <laughs>